Good evening. I'm James Traub. I'm a professor here at NYU Abu Dhabi and a journalist uh, and also the advisor to Vice Chancellor Al Bloom on the Peace Institute, which is the capacity in which I'm here. Wakdar Brahimi is our first Peace Fellow of 2015-16. Uh, I will not give you Wakdar's entire extraordinary biography. I'll just say first that he is one of the greatest UN diplomats of this generation, indeed one of the greatest UN diplomats, period. And I'll just mention three moments uh, which show you the kind of circumstances in which people turn to Lakhdar. The first one is December 2001, when the Taliban fled from Kabul, and the United States suddenly found itself in possession of a country it didn't want. And so they, what they wanted to do was turn it over to the UN. At that time, Lakhdar was the UN Special Representative in Afghanistan. And it was he, very much he, who oversaw what was called the Bonn Process, which was a meeting in Bonn in which all of the Afghan stakeholders were brought together with all of their foreign supporters, at the end of which an Afghan government was stood up. And that Afghan government quite remarkably lasted with all of its flaws. And that was a tremendous personal triumph of Akhtar's. Three years later, the United States conquered another country. This time, they made the mistake of not turning it over to the United Nations. And at the end of 2003, they found that they could not persuade the Iraqis to accept the electoral process that they had devised. And they turned quite desperately to Akhtar, who profoundly did not want to do that. He was no fan of the US invasion of Iraq. But he reluctantly agreed uh, to become the special representative in Iraq. And during the, his six months there, he was able, as the Americans had hoped, to persuade the Iraqis, because of his own personal credibility, uh, to accept a process which would delay the elections and create an interim government which would rule until that time. Third thing, not such a happy story, 2012, after uh, Kofi Annan, who had been serving as the special representative of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to Syria, attempting to broker some kind of peace settlement, had finally quit, Lakhdar, I suspect also quite reluctantly, agreed to take that job and spent the period from 2012 to 2014 trying to find a way of bringing the two parties together, which, alas, proves that there are certain situations so intractable that even Lakhdar can't solve them. So you have before you here someone who really is an extraordinary figure. I think we're very, very fortunate that he's agreed to come here. So Lakhdar, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is really a great honor and a pleasure to be in this amazing campus, the New York University in Abu Dhabi. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry I'm not in my best form. I, that's, again, Abu Dhabi and this campus and the air conditioning. Fortunately, it's, uh, it's all right in this room, but it is not all right anywhere else. All right, Al. Uh, <laughs> note, note to Al. <laughs> Air conditioning. Yes, please. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to you as what, on, on issues that Jim asked me to talk about, and that is what one learns when one moves from, from one of these very, very difficult and unhappy places to another. What is it that one learns? And what does the UN, do, do, what does the UN do? What do they try to do? How well they do it or, uh, or, or not do it well? Uh, I'm going to be a little bit creative and instead I, I have a couple of stories that I uh, tell on occasions like this. I apologize to Barney, he must have heard them about uh, 10 times. Barney Rubin was uh, a companion. I mean, he knows Afghanistan 1,000 better, times better than me, but we were together in Bonn and after Bonn, and we did quite a few things together in Afghanistan and for the Afghans. So my stories are, are the following. I think I am the only UN man 
who met Mullah Muhammad Omar, who died not very long ago and was the uh, leader of the Taliban. In August 1998, the Taliban, who were in the south and had also Kabul, just swept in a kind of blitzkrieg way uh, all the way to the north and took uh, Herat, Mazar Sharif, uh, and, and practically everything of Afghanistan. Uh, and in, part, in, in Mazar Sharif, they killed nine Iranians in the embassy. The Iranian government said they were diplomats. The Taliban said they were uh, spies. But I mean, there is no justification for murdering people like they did, nine, nine of them. They also rounded up all the Iranians they found in, in there and took them to uh, Kandahar as, as prisoners. Uh, of course, you know, the Iranians were beside themselves with, with anger, the government, and also the people of Afghanistan, the people of Iran. Uh, September, uh, Khatami, who was then the president of Iran, came to New York for the General Assembly and uh, attended the meeting between him and Kofi Annan, who was then the Secretary General. And Khatami told, asked uh, uh, Kofi Annan, said, please help us avoid a war with Afghanistan. They had put along the border 200,000 soldiers. So it was quite, quite, quite a problem. I went to uh, Islamabad and then Kandahar, and I saw Mullah Muhammad Omar. We talked for about five hours, and he had with him, you know, we had an interpreter uh, in, in Kabul, uh, but he wasn't great. So I was very happy that the uh, Afghan side, the Taliban, provided their own interpreter. A young man, I mean, I think pro in his early 20s, uh, but although I don't speak Dari, I had the impression that he did a great job. Anyway, after a little bit more than four hours, uh, Muhammad Omar said, look, I, I need to go out and uh, discuss this with uh, my, my advisors. He did so, and he came back and he said, okay, you can take the, the bodies of the uh, people who have been murdered in, in Mazar, and we will release all the Iranian prisoners. Great, great success. War was avoided between the Taliban and, and, and Iran. So I, I, was, uh, I was happy with myself. Everybody thought that I had done a great job. But then uh, a few years later, Barney Rubin uh, came and said, look, I met uh, the, a young man called Rahimullah. He translated for you when you met Muhammad Omar. I said, yes, uh, you know, he's, he's a great, great young man. He said he sends his regards and apologies. The apologies for what? He said he didn't translate what you said correctly. <laughs> I said, how? He said, well, you know, he, he wanted your mission to succeed because he didn't want war with Iran. But you said a few things that Mullah Muhammad Omar wouldn't, wouldn't have liked. <laughs> so he skipped those and, <laughs> and changed them, uh, you know, to please Muhammad Omar. So that's great. What else did he do? He said he also changed a few things Muhammad Omar said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so that was, I mean, I was on the one hand extremely happy and grateful to this young man, but also, you know, I, I was, I was humbled. I, I didn't achieve any success. He did. <laughs> so this story, I mean, you will see why it is, it is relevant to, to, to our discussion. The, um, the uh, other one is, is, is an anecdote that I have known for forever. As a matter of fact, I heard it when I was, uh, I, I was a teenager. But it, I think it is, it is also... Uh, significant for what we are talking about. It's the story of a man, you know, in the days in Europe when there were borders, uh, immigration officers on the borders, and also uh, uh, customs officers. 
So this man goes from France to Spain on a bicycle. He you know, goes to immigration, uh, shows his papers, uh, great. Um, customs say, do you have anything to declare? He says, no, I don't. Say, but you have something on your back, the back of your bicycle. What is it? He said, well, it's a bag of sand. I said, what? I said, yeah, it's a bag full of sand. Why are you taking sand into Spain? He said, it's none of your business. If there is something to pay, I'll pay it. I said, no, there's nothing to pay, bro. So he went. A few days later, the same man arrives from France again with, with the, the, his bicycle and his bag of sand. Three, four, five times like that. So, you know, it's an original. But then there was a, a young customs officer who said, this is, it's not possible. He doesn't look like crazy or stupid. Or, why does he do that? So he confiscated the bag and sent it to Madrid. So, you know, there were probably gold in it uh, or something, gold powder or something. And the answer came from Madrid, no, it is sent, nothing else. So that young man was so curious, he took the man aside and said, you just tell me what is in this sand. Promise we will not take any, any, any measure against you. He said, promise? He said, yes, promise. He said, I'm smuggling bicycles. <laughs> So you will see also why, why this, is, this is relevant. When, when you concentrate on the sand, you don't see the bicycle. Right? Uh, so this is, uh, these are two stories that I'm sure you'll find where they, where they fit. You know, please forgive me if I'm going to tell you a few things about the United Nations that you, you have known as well as I do. And, maybe even better. The United Nations was created in 1945. It is very much the child of the Second World War. And the main uh, aim of the United Nations was to avoid something like the Second World War happening again. Uh, I must say, I think that they, they have achieved that, uh, that objective. There has been no Third World War. Uh, so you can say that you know, their main aim uh, ha has been achieved. But that doesn't mean that there has been no, no conflict uh, you know, under the uh, UN watch. On the contrary, there was, there was quite, quite a lot of, uh, of, of conflict, a lot of fighting, a lot of killing. But you know, for the students, uh, uh, I don't know if you are aware that the Korean War was fought under the flag of the United Nations, not the, the US flag. Uh, you know, that's, that's a story Jim will tell you one day. <laughs> and, uh, but but uh, you, you, I think it is, it, is, it is interesting to know. It's not part of my, it's not part of my story. Um, I don't know also, you know, I, I find, uh, as that's very much part of my story, I find that young people did not follow, uh, or doesn't, don't, young people these days do not know what the struggle uh, against colonialism has been. And the liberation, the liberation movements in Africa and elsewhere, and also in Asia before that, I, I find that young people don't know enough about it. Whereas, of course, for me, you know, I started my life in that, in, 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 in a colonial country and in the struggle uh, for, for independence. And in the struggle for independence uh, and the emancipation of the uh, Asia and, and, and Africa, there is also one conference that, you know, people don't talk about anymore that was hugely important when it took place. That is the Bandung Conference in, in 1955, April 1955, Bandung, Indonesia. Uh, that is the, uh, it is Bandung that opened the way for the non-aligned movement. First conference in Belgrade in 1961, and then the movement uh, beca became also extremely important in that, 
in the, in the 60s and 50s in, in the Cold War. The Americans in particular, but not only they, thought that the non aligned movement was opportunistically situated, they opportunistically situated themselves between uh, the two blocks of the Cold War. But we think that uh, our position was not uh, 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 you know, simply uh, opportunistic, in that we strongly believed in, in peace, we strongly believed uh, that the that war should be avoided between the two the two blocks, and we are perhaps vain enough to think that we have contributed a little bit to that. And so this is a little bit part of our story because uh, you know the the independence the independence movements, especially in Africa, benefited a great deal from. Uh, the support, the moral support of the United Nations. Uh, that support was very, very uh, concrete in the case of South Africa. Uh, apartheid uh, in South Africa was uh, fought very effectively by the United Nations at uh, some stage, I think in 1971, uh, the General Assembly actually excluded South Africa, white South Africa, from the General Assembly, and they never attended the General Assembly again until apartheid ended and Mandela came and represented South Africa in 1994. So this is, you know, this is one work that the United Nations has done uh, 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 very, very, very effectively. Um, now we, we, we go to uh, fast forward, you know what the United Nations is. You know how I came into this. I, I came through the uh, liberation uh, movement to independence, to uh, the Afro-Asian solidarity and cooperation, and the non-aligned movement. I, I arrived to, to the UN. Uh, after I did something not for the UN but with the UN, and that is the uh, uh, the, the, the mediation of uh, the end of civil war in Lebanon, 15 years of uh, of civil war, and I was lucky to come when people were tired and wanted to to end the war in 88, 89. So. We successfully managed to end the civil war in uh, uh, the civil war in Lebanon on behalf of the League of Arab States, but in close cooperation with the United Nations and uh, France and, Brit and the U.S. and the Vatican, which has a lot of influence in uh, in, 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 in Lebanon. So I arrived to, uh, in the United Nations uh, in 1994, and I did you know, all sorts of uh, things uh, went to the Congo, and there I helped form a government like I did in Iraq much later, and not much more successfully. <laughs> uh, I had a brilliant idea in, in Zaire. It was Zaire then. Uh, so corruption in Zaire is really something. And my brilliant idea is that if you bring somebody who has already met ma made millions, he will not be corrupt again. He doesn't need to. So we find that that man, he had been prime minister and he made hundreds of millions. But I think the day after he took over as prime minister, he started stealing again. So that's that's a brilliant idea that did not uh, did not uh, work uh, did not work very much. Um, so the 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 UN uh, after I mean you know in 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 the in the nineties the end of the, the the Cold War it was taken for granted 
that the United Nations had not done that well until then because of the Cold War. You know, the Russians and the Americans were looking at one another, very suspicious of one another, and the Security Council was paralyzed. So now, uh, you know, the UN is going to really come into its own and, and will, will really manage uh, peace and security in the world much, much better than they did. That is when, I don't know if you were already in the UN, when Boutros Ghali was asked to prepare his agenda for peace. Uh, Boutros Ghali had just arrived as, as uh, Secretary General, and he was asked by the Security Council, in particular by the Americans and the Russians, to prepare this agenda for peace to see how the existing problems were going to be uh, tackled. And I think we were very successful in one or two things. Namibia became independent. That is the work of the UN from A to Z uh, in, in, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, a horrible situation that of Cambodia was also brought under control as part of this new uh, uh, atmosphere that existed between the Americans and the Russians and the end of the Cold War and the, uh, I mean, the capability of the, UN, uh, of the UN to act. But at the same time, uh, something else happened and in Europe. And that is the uh, Yugoslavia broke up, and there were those horrible wars there. There, the UN did not do that well. Uh, the, the, the worst episode is called Srebrenica, which is a place that the Security Council had decided would be the uh, would be a safe haven that people who were afraid or under threats elsewhere could go there and they would be protected. And people listened to the UN, believed in the UN, went there and uh, thousands of people were massacred. Uh, not much longer after that, or, 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 or was it before that, uh, another larger proportion uh, disaster happened and that is Rwanda, maybe 800,000 uh, were killed while the UN was, was just uh, watching. Uh, anyway, so this is, these are, you know, the UN did, did well at the very, very beginning, not so well in uh, Rwanda in, and, uh, uh, and Srebrenica and in uh, Bosnia. Uh, but I think you know, they were doing more and more uh, peacekeeping and uh, uh, peace operations. It's interesting to uh, re remind ourselves how peacekeeping started. I think the word peacekeeping doesn't exist in the Charter of the United Nations. That was really a, a hammer shoot when the Congo became independent, but uh, immediately uh, was, uh, you know, People who were in the government were divided and were fighting one another. And Hamashul created this mission to, to the Congo. It ultimately killed him. Uh, it is in the Congo that uh, he was flying out of the Congo when his plane was brought down or had an engine failure and fell. And Hamashul was, uh, uh, was killed in 19, in beginning of September. 1961. Uh, yes, beginning of September, middle of September, or end of September, because we were in Belgrade at the, uh, at the uh, non-aligned conference, and a few days later we heard that uh, he, 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 was, he was there. From there, you know, peacekeeping has, has grown and, and, and grown, and a lot of people have been involved, military, civilians, uh, at the beginning, uh, in, uh, you know, European countries, uh, Canada uh, participated in peacekeeping, but then slowly they, they withdrew and left it to third world countries alone to uh, 
So, you know, we, we, we have that. I mean, the United Nations has been everywhere. It has mixed record, success in a lot of places, not so much success in other places. So what, what, what is it that uh, we have learned from, uh, uh, from, from, from all, you know, all these activities that have been going on since 1961 and continue to this day? Uh, you know, they, I think in the Congo, it, they started with something like two or 3,000 soldiers. Uh, in 1961. Now, the UN is deploying 100,000 soldiers around the world, plus about 20,000 civilians who work uh, in these missions. That is, uh, you know, until Iraq and, uh, and, and Afghanistan, the US had more troops deployed outside of its country than the UN. Now the UN has more uh, troops deployed around the world than anybody else. That is, and the budget uh, they spend on this is around 10 billion. So it is, it is substantial uh, uh, kind of work that, uh, that is being done. What are the many lessons that one, uh, one, 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 one learns? Uh, and first of all, the, the UN is criticized by everybody, myself included, but it, I call it the indispensable organization. I don't think the world can do with, with, without it. And this has been the case, uh, you know, throughout uh, probably the worst crisis that has taken place and really threatened the world with uh, a nuclear war was the so-called uh, uh, Cuban missiles crisis in September of 1962. That was resolved by the Russians and the Americans directly between Washington and Moscow. But the contacts and the discussions took place in New York. I happened to be there. That was our first year as, 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 as members of the United Nations. And, and we saw this uh, you know, from, from very close quarters. Uh, it is in the UN that all the contacts have taken place. And it is with the help of the United Nations and the, thanks to the fact that the United Nations existed that that crisis uh, was avoided. So, you know, criticize the, the UN as much as you like, but don't forget that you will need it one day. And yeah, I'm sure we will need it again. Um, this is, this is uh, one, one, one observation. Um, for for, for peace, peacekeeping missions, in, in, I mean, specifically, uh, what I, have, what I have learned is that one never knows enough about the country where one is going to. Never. No matter how familiar you are with the place, no matter how much you read, no matter how much you listen. I mean, Barney and four other people tried to educate me on Afghanistan when I was appointed first time in, 1990, in 1997. But what I discovered is that he and his friends, you know, high caliber experts, they don't agree with one another. That means they have, don't have the same view about what the country is. And when I went there myself, I have discovered, uh, you know, more questions that, than they had answered when, when I met them in, in, in New York. So this is, this is a hugely important lesson for anybody who wants to be involved in, in peacekeeping find out more and more and more and more, and uh, that, will, that will help you. Also, you, you don't know enough because, you know, a, a conflict situation is, is a dynamic situation. It's not static. So what you have learned and read and so on 
we change under your eyes, uh, if not every day, uh, a, a lot of time during the, 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 the time that you spent in, 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 in the country. So this is, this is, the, the, this is the, first, uh, the first lesson. Um, the next one uh, that, is, that is very important is the story of Rahimullah. I think one has to be humble. Uh, it is easy to, uh, it, is, it is easy and tempting. So, I mean, these people have been killing one another. They have been destroying their country. Uh, stupid people. I, I know much better than they do what, what, what is good for them. You, you don't. Uh, so, uh, being humble is, 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 is indispensable if you want to do if you want to do a good job. And by being humble, what you need is show respect uh, and understanding and patience to to the people you deal with, no matter how difficult and at, at times quite often unreasonable, brutal, difficult. You have got to show uh, respect, uh, and you have got to have uh, patience. So uh, you know these are these are individual qualities that one has uh, uh, you know, has, has to to go with or or learn. Uh, the university is there is here to teach you some of uh, of these things. The third point is. Uh, again, it's something very, very well known in these situations. It, it is high expectations, how to manage high expectations. When, when a UN mission is set up, more likely than not, the country has already gone very, very deep into crisis. It has been destroyed, people are hungry, uh, you know, the future is bleak in, in front of their eyes, and they see this, you know, the United Nations coming, the United Nations, you know, with the um, Americans voting for that and maybe even participating in some manner. Uh, so, you, you know, they expect the world from you. And you are not going to be able to give them the world. So, you know, this is extremely difficult. How? You know, how are you going to tell people not to expect that much? But at the same time, you, are not, you cannot tell them, look, we are useless. You know, uh, don't expect anything from us. So, you know, finding that, that, that balance is, is, uh, is, is terribly important. And the earlier, uh, the earlier, the better. How are we doing for, with time? Yeah, I think a few more minutes is yeah. fine. Well, the few more minutes, I'll, I'll use them to speak about two, two, two other things that are done in every, in every mission. Uh, that is elections and constitution making. Uh, we, for a long time, uh, elections have been called the exit strategy by excellence. Somehow, it was thought that if you organize an election, some miracle will happen and everything will be all right. I think we have discovered that it is not, it's not the case. Uh, elections are terribly important, useful, must take place, but they have got to take place at the right time and in the right sequence with other things. If they are organized too early, they can do, uh, they will not do the good you expect from them. They may even do a lot of harm. In Angola, an, an election, a national election that was uh, pronounced free and fair by President Carter, by the European Union, the African Union, it was then the OEU, uh, and the Euro you know, I don't know who else. Everybody agreed that it was a great election. It started, it restarted the war for 10 years. So this is what, uh, you know, an election that, is, that takes place at the wrong time does. The same thing about uh, constitutions. Uh, you know, Barney and I worked very, very hard to provide Afghanistan with a constitution. We were successful. But in, in 
hindsight, I wish we never did, we never did that. You know, in Bonn, what we did was take the 1964 constitution that uh, uh, Zahir Shah, the king of those days, had provided the country with a beautiful, modern, uh, progressive constitution. We took from it all the articles uh, dealing with the monarchy. And I think Afghanistan could have lived 10 years with that. Uh, at least or more, I think it's a very, very good question. We took the risk of uh, having this. We were on the verge of failures, I don't know how many times. And if we had failed, I think it would have done a lot, a lot of harm to, 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 to Afghanistan. Uh, South Africa uh, did it differently. South Africa, uh, you know, they, they took four years of negotiations from the day Mandela was, re was, uh, was, uh, was released. And of course, years of negotiations had taken place with Mandela when he was in jail. Four years after he was released, they organized an election. And that election was, was a terrible failure, technically. But you had two great leaders, Mandela and Duclerc. And they, they managed the results of, uh, of, of the election. And they, the, the assembly they, they, they elected had a dual function. Uh, one, a, a legislative body, and one constitutional body. And they, they have taken two, three, four years before they had their constitution. And that's why you know, there's a lot of things that are not uh, right in, 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 in South Africa. But nobody is complaining about the constitution. Tunisia has done also very well recently. They have uh, uh, they, 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 they elected a, best, a kind of constitutional assembly to, supposed to finish in one, less than one year. But they allowed it to continue for, I think, two more years until they reached a, a, a you know, full consensus between all the parties uh, that have so, you know, that is, that is some of the lessons. There is plenty, plenty others, but Jim will not allow me to continue. To it's my fault. Uh, yeah, it is, it is his fault. Yeah. Um, you know, the UN, as I told you, has 100,000 100, soldiers. Uh, a lot of us are rather frightened by, by that. It is too much. Uh, and that reminds me of another story. I think Barney also knows it. It is, I mean, fitting in, in, in Abu Dhabi to speak about camels. So there was this Bedouin, and they were moving. So they, and they undid, I don't know what the word is, the tent, and they were putting all these things on the back of the camel. You know, one thing after the other, and so on. Very high. And the, the Bedouin came with big bag, and said in front of the camel, I, I don't know whether I should add this or not. And the camel said, go right ahead, I'm not getting up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I hope that you people will not uh, you know, make a camel of the United Nations and pile up <laughs> things on them, and I will tell you we can't get up. Thank you very much, and we'll answer you. Well, Akhtar, you were as advertised. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I think the headline is, Akhtar Brahimi spent five hours talking to Mullah Omar. <laughs> I, I want to come back to that in a moment. But I was actually very intrigued that you brought us back to the moment of your generation, which is the moment mm. of Bandung, the moment of these liberation struggles. What I want to ask you is this, that, that your generation had this vision for mm. the Middle East and North Africa, mm. this secular nationalist, sure. socialist vision, which failed in so many ways. Yeah. And then there was this moment four or five years ago in the Arab Spring when it was reasonable to think that that moment had returned. That sure. And that too has failed. So when you think about your own region and that set of hopes you had, What's your sense of why that has failed so deeply? Yeah, well, this is... Uh, yeah, we failed. Our generation failed. No doubt about that. Uh, 
we didn't know how to manage expectations. Mm. Uh, we made a lot of progress in a lot of places, but we haven't been able, I think, the, if there is one, if you want one piece in the jigsaw that, that was, you know, wrong, it is institutions. We were not able to create a you know, viable, uh, viable institution. Is that in part because rule was so personalized? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it was that. You know, there was nothing wrong with Nasser being the leader he mm. was. There was nothing wrong with Bimbilla in Algeria mm. and Boumediene being the people mm. they were. Uh, the thing is, they never thought of what would happen after them. Uh, you see the difference between, between, say, Nehru, on the one hand, I think he's the only one, uh, and, and the rest of us, is that Nehru, from the beginning, he had as much personal power that, than Nasser, Sukarno, a, anybody you want. But he, he exercised that power through institutions. Nehru, in the beginning, the Congress Party in India, <laughs> had near unanimity mm -hmm. in Congress, in, in, in Parliament. There were two or three socialists, one of them, I, I, remember, I, I think I, I remember, Narayan, who is a friend of Nehru. Mm. But Nehru would come every Thursday to answer questions in Parliament. He didn't need to. But you're yeah. also talking yeah. about democracy when you say that. Nehru uh, believed yeah, yeah. in democracy in a way that many of these other leaders did not. I'm, I'm not sure about no. that. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure about All right. that. I worship at the shrine of Nehru. So. I, I, I like it, Nehru. I met him. Uh, uh, you know, he's, a, he's a great guy. How de you know, democratic he was, I don't know. But he created the instrument for democracy yeah. for after him. His daughter was not a great democrat. No, as she was not. But then these institutions have beaten her. And she came back yes. as, as, as a democrat. Institutions were created. I must say also that India benefited from the fact that the British left uh, a, an incredibly good judicial system. So was there, to some extent, good colonialism and bad colonialism? Uh, no, there is only no. bad colonialism. Okay, all right. Just trying to bait you on uh, that one. They, they, they sometimes make mistakes and do right. uh, you know, one or two things. Right? They accidentally did they, something good. Yeah, they, yeah. The, the judicial yeah. system yeah. was very good. And, you know, what is, you know, if you are talking about now what should happen here and there and how, the rule of law is the most important thing that you can, that you need to provide. Everything else will come from, from the rule of law. You know, if I can go, you know, you are pushed around in life, wherever you are, in New York or in Sweden or anywhere, but you have a recourse. If I don't have a recourse, that is where problems start. Mm -hmm. So the rule of law existed in, 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 in India, and it did not quite exist. I think Egypt had quite a good judicial system. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we didn't, uh, we are building one now. Uh, and, and do you feel coming back to this moment, the post-Arab yeah. spring moment, is, is, is this incredible unexpected fever of Islamism, mm -hmm. is that the thing which has filled the blank space yeah. that is Absolutely. left by those failures, the yeah. failure of rule of law yeah. and so Absolutely. forth? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, uh, we, we, uh, You know, liberation from colonialism was also about reinstating Islam, uh, which you know, uh, you know, Islam in Algeria was was ignored, did not exist. Uh, so it, it was about allowing people to show that they were they were Muslim. That's great, uh, but our education system was extremely weak, very very weak, and. Uh, you know, Islamic groups and uh, organizations and so on were very active, and they they have they have influenced uh, the young much more than our uh, secular system of education. Uh, and and we failed. 
So people were, were looking around. Communism had, had failed. Uh, socialism, you know, we spoke of, did not produce uh, what people wanted. And Muslims were there telling them, come, we, we have something to offer you. Mm. They won't. Mm. You can't blame them. Uh, so that is why I tell you know, our people, as you know, we had a horrible 10 years in Algeria. I used to tell my friends and people over there, we are responsible for what is happening. Mm. Uh, these young people went to school with my kids. So why, why have they chosen now to go up and destroy the, the, the industrial base we have, we have, we have built and to, to, to kill kids in, 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 their, in, their, in their homes? Something has been, you know, uh, so we did something wrong. Mm. There, so a, I welcome yeah. the Arab Spring. And I used to say before and after that has happened, you know, that change is unavoidable in our, in our region and in Africa. I said this to Liz Doucette in South Africa about a year before, uh, before December, December 2010 in, in, in Tunisia. Uh, change is coming. Our governments can lead that change. If they don't, they will be its victims. And this is what has happened to the government in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. Syria is uh, struggling, I and mean, the regime in Syria is struggling to survive. I don't think that ultimately they will. Do you think, I mean, a little more broadly, you and I talked about this the other night, the Middle East was, was for a long time a place which was truly a polyethnic, multi-sectarian, sure. multi-confessional. Sure. Syria was a great example of that. Lebanon still is. Is that history now? Is it now no I longer possible in, in this part of the I world to have these truly uh, 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 heterogeneous uh, nations? I hope not. I hope, I hope that we'll go back to that. I mean, you know, you would expect me to say that. I belong to that generation, you know. I, I had friends in Lebanon and Syria and Iraq. For 20 years, I never bothered to ask who is Christian, who is Muslim, who is Sunni, who is Shia. I have a friend, he's still around, I think he's in Qatar now, Lebanese, for 30 years. It is only after the, 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 the uh, after all these things that I asked him, oh, by the way, what are you? Mm. Uh, and he told me that he was a Christian. Uh, the, I, the people I know now, if you ask me who is Shia, who is Sunni, I, I don't know. I don't know who is Shia or Sunni. So you would expect me to say, yeah, I mean, you, we have But I wonder, once that. people start killing each other over identities they used to take for mm. granted, is that a thing that you can reverse? Uh, I hope so. Mm. I hope so. I hope so, and you know, in Syria in particular, Syria cannot be anything else but a multi-ethnic uh, uh, place. Uh, and I, you know, a lot of people have, have criticized me for that, I still maintain that people who are dreaming of cutting Syria into pieces uh, are wrong, uh, I mean doubly wrong, because that shouldn't be done, and because that will not happen. Either Syria becomes again what it has been, or then it becomes Somalia. Do you think, do you think, yeah, that's a, a terrifying thought. I want everyone to register that thought, that, that uh, the bad scenario with Syria is not that it breaks up into three pieces, but that it becomes Somalia. That's a, obviously a terrifying prospect. So, but do you think, is, is there in Syria a path which does not lead to Assad staying there for the foreseeable future, but actually lead, uh, leads to his leaving in, in some predictable way? Do you see a possible diplomatic path where Russia and the United sure. States... Uh, so what is that space that the two of them could find in common? I gave it to them, but they refused Yeah, yeah, no, so the, tell us. <laughs> tell us what that formula should be. Um, you see, in, it, it, it's, it is not the first time that you have a situation where... <coughs> the ideal solution is a solution that is worked by the people themselves. Mm. So in Syria, the ideal solution is a solution that is worked by the Syrians, 
who will tell you, thank you very much, we don't need you, we're going to sort our food. That's, that's not, not going to happen at any time soon. The second best may be, you know, neighbors, caring neighbors who go there and say, no, this is unacceptable. Let's help you find your way. That is also not possible because the neighbors are as polarized as, as, uh, as, as the Syrians themselves. I thought that you had... By the neighbors, you mean the Turks, the Saudis, the, Turks, the Qataris? The, the Arabs and, yeah. and, and the Iranians. Yeah. Yeah. The Iranians are 100% with the government. Mm. The others are 100% against the government. And each side think that, or thought until recently, that they were going to win. So when people like Kofi Annan and I come around and say, you know, Nobody is going to win this world. You know, they don't. They stop listening. Of course, we are going to win. So leave us alone. Mm-hmm. That's uh, yeah. Um, so you know, you had to start from the outer circle. The outer circle is the international community, and the international community, even after the Cold War, is Russia and, and the United States. As you know, I brought them together. We worked together, but we didn't move uh, fast enough. And then Ukraine came and. Uh, all sorts of things happen. I'm very happy now that uh, these meetings are taking place in Vienna. Mm. This is, you know, the, 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 the conference that I was accused of organizing in Geneva was, uh, you know, we had 40, 40 countries, including Australia, Argentina, Mexico, and we didn't invite Iran. You like or dislike Iran, it is not, it's not a matter, but they have to be there. And you have got to... Sh- but it was not, by the way, the Americans, but the Saudis who wouldn't allow Iran to be invited. Yeah, but yes. ultimately it's the Americans. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> you mean this, the Amer- if the Americans had told the Saudis, got to let it happen, yeah. then they would have no, let it the happen. the Saudis told them anyway. But, yeah. you know, okay. Uh, uh, but, uh, so, you know... Uh, some people in this part of the world accused me of being pro-Iranian. I don't see why I should be pro-Iranian. When I was in Iraq, they were insulting me every day in their review. So, uh, but uh, I, Iran is part of the problem, very, very much so. You can't imagine how much they are spending on Syria. Billions, billions, literally billions. Weapons, medicine, food, cooking gas, all comes from, from, from Iran. But being part of the problem, you have got to bring them and make them part of the solution. You know, you can't... I mean, what is happening in Iraq now is, is crazy. What is happening in Iraq is largely the fault of Iran. Now. You know, the origin, Qaeda was the fault of the United States. Daesh is more the fault of Iran. They dominate Iraq. And they have created this situation where the Sunnis feel totally alienated. And, and the current and, Shia government, moderate, moderate though it is, cannot break no, away from the Iranian influence. No, no, they, You don't they, see a body as being significantly a different figure from no, Maliki in that respect? No, no, no not, not that no. much. Okay. I mean, he, he may be different. I hope he's different. But he, he cannot say no to yeah. Iran. He cannot. He's, he's run by, yeah. from, 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 uh, from Tehran. And you tell them, we are going to solve your problem for you, get rid of Daesh for you, mm. and we don't ask you anything. This is the opportunity to tell them, come here. Look what you have done. You, you have created Daesh. You have been responsible for the creation of Daesh. So you have got to tell us that you are going to change, that you are going to act differently. No sign of that yet. No sign of that yet. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the nuclear deal was... Was, uh, was, was a positive development. And I hope that the Americans now can talk to Iranians. And don't forget that in Iran, you have a lot, a lot, a lot of people who are not happy with the situation they have. And they would like their country to be open to the rest of the world so that they can breathe a little bit more. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, you know, what is happening in Vienna is... Is, is promising. Uh, in Saudi Arabia today, I think the opposition are starting to see how they can organize themselves to meet the government. 
So let, let's hope that yeah. it won't. Okay. This, this uh, situation between Russia and Turkey is, is not very good. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, and it's giving Russia a good reason to do the wrong things. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people will do wrong things yeah. because of that. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you believe that the situation in Iraq and the problems in Iraq and Syria could be re resolved separately? And the other question is about the past. We know there were a thousand mistakes after the invasion of Iraq, but which one was the worst? <laughs> <laughs> so hard to choose. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's a very good question. Uh, Iraq and Syria now are you know, melting uh, into one another uh, because or thanks to Daesh. Uh, I think that you know, the two issues can be treated separately, but in parallel. Uh, what I hope will happen in Vienna is that uh, they will talk about Syria, but they will keep an eye on Iraq and see what can be done in Iraq. You've got to talk to the uh, Iranians, to the Turks, to the Saudis, who are the neighbors of Iraq, who, who are suffering and will suffer more and more if the situation does not improve in Iraq. Uh, so, you know, you are not going to solve the two issues. You are not going to say, let's put the two problems together and work on them and we will, you know, if you can solve one up before the other, why not? But I think it is, it is uh, now, uh, everybody has to realize that this, this, uh, 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 two crises are interfering with with, with uh, each other. With each other. Uh, you and are right. In, worst you know, problem? Huh? Worst American mistake of the thousand? <laughs> Dissolving uh, the army or debathification? Both. I both. Think, yeah, both. Yeah. You know, I think you know both were wrong because, but but dissolving the army is much worse. Much much worse. I think. You see, this is, again, one of the things that I, I wonder about. There are a lot of real experts in America about Iraq. A lot. And I, am, I know that, if, I, I know directly that a few of them told the government, you know, fine, if you are invading Iraq, but don't dissolve the army. And they did not listen. I am puzzled, I'm puzzled by, by, by that. Debatification also was, uh, you know, they, they, they gave it to uh, Sherabi, uh, who passed away uh, not long ago, uh, to play with. Uh, and they should have known that the party was the state. You, you couldn't be a teacher. You couldn't get a promotion in the government if you didn't have your, your party car. And they, they have... So they have given potentially hundreds of thousands of people to Al-Qaeda and Daesh uh, by, by, by these two actions. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ahmed from Afghanistan. From? Afghanistan. Yeah, and I want to say uh, many thanks to you and Abdurrahim for all what you did for Afghanistan and for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, I just have two questions. The first question is that uh, what Abdurrahim did in Afghanistan do you think it's something professional? He was a humble man, but do you think he was a humble man? Who? Uh, Abdurrahim. Muhammad the, Omar? No, Abdurrahim. Abdurrahim? Yeah, the translator, I think it was. Ah, uh, Rahimullah. <laughs> Rahimullah, yeah, sorry. Mm. sorry. So do you think it, that what he did was professional? Oh, uh, this is the way how diplomats work, mm. uh, usually in negotiations. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad that he was such a, a, a lousy diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my second question is that your experience in your idea in, in uh, Zaire, why it's not working in many countries like Pakistan and other countries? So, yeah, just that. Thank you. Uh, That's a big one. You know, Rahimullah was not a professional translator. He was a young man with the Taliban. And you will be interested to know that he ultimately, after you know, some years, he got a scholarship to Yale. Really? Yeah. 
And, but then there was an outcry by the neocons, and uh, so they, Yale elegantly encouraged him to go to visit his family, and he didn't get a visa to come back. Uh, <laughs> but he went to the American University in Beirut. Huh? In Cairo, sorry. The American University in Cairo, and he graduated one, three, four years ago. Uh, so he, you know, he's, he, he really wanted to have an education, and he has, he has got it in the American University in, in, in Cairo. Uh, for the rest, you, you know, I, I'm not uh, an expert on either Pakistan or any other country, uh, but uh, they need an Arab Spring too, I suppose. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mr. Brahimi, for that uh, wonderful uh, tour through the timeline. Um, My former student. <laughs> yes, please continue. Um, uh, Mr. Brahimi, considering the uh, big role that superpowers play, considering, the, considering the big role that superpowers play in the negotiations of these huge conflicts, um, especially after uh, and going to Syria, after considering what um, Robert Ford, the former ambassador to Syria, uh, said about how um, his disagreement about how America was labeling moderates in Syria uh, who were in the Free Syrian Army as people who were not for the Assad regime or against the Assad regime. And um, considering also from uh, Muazzin Akbik, who is the uh, um, Free Syrian Army representative, who talked about how they tried to help the Russians and assure their, uh, their interests in Syria, which are the bases that are in Syria right now. Considering that superpowers in, in, with America, for example, misgaging the mitigation risks of, of risks in Syria, and Russia not being able to compromise, how do you, in this, types of, in this type of stalemate, what would, be a, uh, what would a diplomat like you do to mitigate such a crisis? Mm. I do nothing. No. <laughs> But so how much blame should attach to the uh, misunderstandings and intransigence of Russia and the United States when you sort of are meeting out blame for this catastrophe? Uh, I mean, you know, the short answer is that I don't know really. Uh, but it is, it is fully understandable that the country, big or small, uh, looks after its own interest first and foremost. That is, whether it's America or Russia or, or Lebanon. Or, but, uh, you know, I'm naive enough to believe that uh, if you are the United States, if you are Russia, if you are, you know, the main members of the Security Council, if you, are, you cling to your veto power and so on, you want to be responsible uh, and act responsibly internationally. So go to Syria, protect your interests, but look also at the interests of the Syrian people. And my impression is that, uh, you know, nobody is really, uh, you know, when I'm angry, I say only Ban Ki-moon, Kofi Annan, and I think of the Syrian, of the interests of the Syrian people. Everybody else put the interests of the Syrian people at best in, in second place. If you, are, if you are trying to help Syria out of its predicament, think of the interest of the, of the Syrian people. Uh, and especially that, uh, and this was, I, I think I said it in the first report of the Security Council, you cannot anywhere close a conflict like this within the borders of one country. It will spill over to immediate neighborhood and then farther afield. So the Europeans are discovering that there are refugees now. I mean, why didn't they ask the Lebanese? Four million and a half Lebanese, they have two million refugees. And they have had them for quite some time. So the Europeans are discovering refugees now and they, oh yes, they come from Syria. So let's see what we can do for Syria. I think if we had done something for Syria in 2011, 2012, there will be no refugees in, in, in Europe.